Hi, everyone. For those of you who are joining us, uh, my name is Edith Young. I am a founders of Founders Hong Kong and also Race Capital um, and advisor to 500. Today, I'm super excited uh, to have Yat, who's a long time. We know each other for a long time, but this is our first sort of webinar together. I'm super excited to have him. And normally he's based out of Hong Kong, but he's definitely one of the most successful success story of Hong Kong as a founder and also as an investor. But before we begin, just for those of you who are new to Founders Hong Kong, Founders Hong Kong is a nonprofit organization with the mission to connect Silicon Valley um, to founders in Hong Kong, regardless as for fundraising or for go to market. Um, last year, for the first time, we put together a virtual accelerator uh, coverage by um, TechCrunch and many great media. Um, we very likely will be doing it again sometime this year, but you know, our mission is really all about helping founders. For those of you in particular associated with Hong Kong, we are here for you. So once a month, this particular investor series is about inviting amazing investor uh, to share what they're looking for, tips. And today I'm gonna invite Yad, maybe turn on video to join us, um, not only speaking from a investor point of view, but also from a founder point of view. Um, so really quick background. So I, I honestly, yeah, I don't even remember how we met, but I just felt like I, I, we met, we know each other forever for a long, long time, but we've never done this before. So it's really about us like chatting. Um, but before that, maybe before we go into sort of tips and tricks and like fundraising and, or, or how do we pitch you and all that, maybe if it's okay to share with us some of your story. Because what actually impressed me the most is you have the music background, uh, which is mind blowing for me. And the fact that you actually grew up in Austria, which I really I'm like, oh my God, you're the first one. Um, I'd love to learn more about sort of your, your journey. Um, sort of how do you actually from the music path to Outblaze to now and Mocha and gaming and startup and all that. I'm going to let you talk. Thank you so much. And it's a great pleasure being here. And yes, we have known each other for donkey years, so I don't actually remember. Uh, but I think I think the very first time we may have met was at a conference. I think you were with Maxton, the browser company. Was it right? Dolphin Browser. Dolphin. I'm sorry. Wrong. Different browser company. But yes, you were with the browser. So before 500, before that, I think that was the first time uh, we met at some conference. So anyway, long time ago. But yeah, so you know, great, great pleasure to be here. Uh, I grew up in Vienna, in Austria. I was born and raised there. So technically, German is my mother tongue. And, you know, my parents were both musicians. And as a result of that, you know, we are all generally, if this is Founders Hong Kong, then we can have some empathy to the fact that we have Asian tiger parents. Everything we know about them is true. So, you know, I had no choice. I had to study music as well. And as an only child, basically, I was almost, I was kind of forced into a musical career because that was really what my parents knew at the time. But I think... Well, the interesting thing, if I look back into my background, was less about music, although certainly that taught me discipline. I think the real big thing was the fact that I grew up in a place like Austria as perhaps the only Chinese person in what appears to be a 50 square mile radius. Uh, and also, even though I spoke the language naturally and I was clearly, you know, I guess local in a sense in Austria, I was not really, right? Just because, especially in the 70s and 80s, you know, there was a, definitely a distinction between being Chinese. It wasn't a bad kind of racism. It was just more like, I don't know what Chinese people look like. <laughs> it's like it was a strange, so, so I think that kind of inside out viewpoint definitely had an impact on, 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 on me looking back, right? Uh, the other thing is that 70s and 80s was still the Cold War in Europe. And especially when you think about what's happening now with Russia and Ukraine and you know other places around the world, actually this starts to ring even more true today. But back then I grew up in a time where the world was very different. And, you know, when people, you know, especially now that I'm in the US, people say, oh, socialism is communism. You have not seen what true communism is like, <laughs> if you, if, you know, if you cross the border. Like I, my mom used to work at the Komisch Opa, which is basically across the border in East Berlin. And, right. you know, when I would visit her, sometimes I would travel there and I would see her across the border. It was a completely different world, right? It was not, night and day between, between those worlds. So all of these things had impact on sort of the way I sort of think of the world. Uh, I think ultimately, but of course, looking back, I have no idea what it would look like. It's just that these all had impressions on me and how I got involved really with tech really and, and sort of my entrepreneurial journey. I think part of it really was the fact that 
I was using a computer in the 80s, got online through a service called CompuSurf, which for probably most people in this room <laughs> very likely don't even know what that is, but it is a pre-internet type service. And that's how we used to connect online and we would connect with these acoustic couplers. And what I did was I wrote software as a kid, uh, MIDI software, mm. really to help me sort of uh, do better at school because I wasn't as gifted as my fellows, uh, sort of uh, as, a, as a fellow other students. You know, music is like sports. Some people just have it, right? So if you have, if you're really good at music, you just have it, right? And like, and, and so I wasn't that good. So I had to work much harder than others just to get there. And so I think with the computer, I was able to cheat because I was able to compose faster than my other, guy, other, other students. And that software, even though my teachers didn't like it because they basically said that's cheating, my, my other sort of people online who enjoyed the software started sending me money. And eventually it got me a job at Atari who said, oh, I like the software that you built. Why didn't you come here? And that really was interesting for me because, you know, I was, you know, obviously, you know, first time in my life as a child receiving recognition independently mm -hmm. of what I was doing. So that's obviously kind of an empowering feeling. And then I ended up getting a job at Atari and it didn't matter, you know, that I was, you know, basically, you know, at the time, Chinese or certainly Chinese looking. Uh, and I was a child. It didn't matter. It just mattered that I knew how to write software. And I think this was, this sort of experience led me ultimately to do different sort of technology journeys. It eventually brought me to Hong Kong where I set up one of Hong Kong's first ISPs called Hong Kong Online. This was in the early nineties, you know, and I think <laughs> our first browser, I think we were using, I mean, I was using Mosaic in the US at that point, but I think we were using, you know, Netscape or versions like this. It was really old, old days back then. Uh, mm -hmm. And then eventually led to building Outplays um, some years later. That's amazing. How old were you when you get a job in Atari? So I think it was around um, uh, 13 or 14. Maybe, maybe so, so it was such a long time ago, but around that age, yeah. That's amazing. You know, Atari, for those of you um, who are into gaming, this is really the, this is the most, I, I listened to, um, what's, what's the founder of Atari again? Well, name? the original founder was Nolan Bushnell, but I wasn't, I wasn't, um, so Atari went through many iterations. So by the time I was working for Atari, it went through the third generation under the Tremios. But, but uh, you know, Nolan Bushnell was the original founder of Atari. Yeah. But, so like the other day, um, I should, I'm not, should not be advertising some other, uh, alert, I was listening to uh, Acquire um, and they actually interviewed Nolan mm. Bushnell. Yeah, he's great. And it was amazing, like how he also started uh, coding when he was like a, a teenager. So, so yeah, it's sort of like a modern days uh, Nolan. All right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so, so, so with your gaming background, I guess like you, uh, Atari really is the most iconic, I think, you know, gaming companies. And then is that why, how it sort of leads into now today, and Mocha Brands to me is not only a gaming company, is really mm -hmm. super active in gaming, you're investing, like, I, yeah. I remember when we met, since you mentioned I worked on a browser, we were trying to, um, I think we were trying to do some partnership like in HTML5 games and, and promote all that. But this is so long ago. Now I felt like Animoca Brands is so much more. So mm -hmm. what is like now your, your vision for the companies? Are you a gaming company? Are you an investment firm? What's, what's happening there? So Animoca's real vision and mission is to deliver two digital property rights. <clears throat> now, what we mean by that is, that our goal is really to ensure that everyone owns their data and has data sovereignty in the form of property. And that's one of the reasons why we really fell in love with blockchain because that paradigm was not possible with that. And you know, if I look at all my previous history building businesses, you know, whether it's an ISP or working for Atari or even with Outblaze, which was a early, very early cloud computing platform with email, which we later sold to IBM, or even in the first iterations, of you know, making mobile games with was, was the predecessor of Animoca brands, which is Animoca itself, right? You know, mm -hmm. all of these experiences, you know, have led to kind of this moment, I would say. And it's kind of one of those things where, you know, you can never really plan for what your future will look like. They only start making sense when you look back and say, oh, actually this experience and that experience and this experience all led to this moment. And so the richness of those experiences and the diversity of opportunity is kind of what led to this moment where we are today, right? And one of the big moments was the fact that we got the platform from the App Store. So we were one of the biggest 
traditional mobile game developers in 2011. And mm. in early 2012, Apple removed all of our apps. It was, you know, maybe 180 apps or like a large number. And Apple removed our apps because we had figured out at the time that if we launch apps very quickly, sometimes once a week or more, mm. we would always be at the top of the app store, right? And if you remember back then, you know, app store discovery was really the way to get success. There was no implicit rule that said you couldn't do that, except that you're not supposed to game the app store. But of course, nobody called us from Apple in 2011 and said, we don't like what you do, right? Could you please change it? They just removed it, no questions asked, right? And at that time, there was no, um, there was no uh, office in Hong Kong. There was no app store in, in, in greater China region because back then nobody cared about the China market. So they didn't care about the developers. So we were basically easy prey. And to this day, I have no idea basically who, who made that decision. And I probably never will. Right? So this decision, you know, basically, and things, the experiences thereafter have led to a different journey where it came a very strong realization that we have all become digital dependents. Now, if you remember back in the 90s, actually the internet was open, right? And it was open source and we had freedom of information and freedom of access. That all became centralized and controlled by the platforms. And today, actually, those decisions no longer are entirely ours. In fact, in many cases, they aren't ours at all. Because who decides whether the, your app can exist in the App Store or on Steam or on Facebook? Mm -hmm. And even your own personal identity is removed in terms of your ability to control. In fact, if Facebook decides to remove you and your Instagram account, you're gone, right? You're erased from history like you don't exist. So this basically thinking led to this idea that when we encountered CryptoKitties through our investment which, uh, with Fuel Powered, which was actually co-developing uh, CryptoKitties at the time, which led us to our first investment in the NFT space, you know, basically in late 2017, early 2018, and also us being a publisher of CryptoKitties, that is mm. when we felt very strongly, this is how we can take back control of our digital ownership because the paradigm had shifted from one where it was just about free distribution of information yeah. uh, to basically one where we could own basically a part of it. And, and that's, that's, that's how we got into this. So the mission is true digital ownership and delivering that. And now why people think that we're focused on gaming, uh, which is the initial part, right? And a really big part of what we're doing is because we believe, and you know, most gamers already understand virtual ownership better than most, because yeah. gamers have virtual assets. They buy skins. They don't think they're renting it, even though that's what they're doing. So we felt that they would be the easier audience to onboard than, say, my mom, <laughs> right? yeah. who, who, who doesn't really you know, care much about digital ownership per se. Yeah, I, I, like since you mentioned about uh, crypto kitties, so now, like, Recently, I didn't realize until recently you also did. Um, I actually, by the way, it is on the record. Um, you introduced me. I think you hosted a, a gaming conference, a crypto gaming conference in Hong Kong. You actually introduced me for Exit Infinity. I didn't do anything. This is probably like fought on my part. But now, like since then, you're super active. Um, so Crypto Kitty was the beginning, but then um, Exit Infinity, Open C. Um, sandbox and now like you you also like running no for flow there's like a lot of things going on so I guess you know as a community in the crypto mm. gaming space you're very active in like all area is that sort of the direction that you want to continue to grow uh, going forward yes so I think the important thing to think about broadly speaking, and why we made all these investments, we have done now over 150 investments in the space, mm -hmm. but we also build our own products. Like Sandbox is actually a group company. We, we're actually building Sandbox, or we're building Rev, or we're building Tower. So we have 12, 12 actually separate metaverses we're building, but we're also, we're very early investors in like OpenSea and in Wax and Decentraland as well, right? And of course, yeah. Axie Infinity and, and all these companies as well that today have become quite famous. And the reason we did that is because we believe in the shared network effect of what is now known as Web3, mm -hmm. meaning that it doesn't really, you know, like the classic VC investing style has been about trying to look for zero sum outcomes. You know, who's the winner? Who's the winner takes all scenario, which we felt that with Web3 is actually more true to the original Web1 scenario with open source, that that, that, that no longer is true. In fact, that's what we prefer, meaning we could all kind of win. In order to actually build it out this way, we have to facilitate people's growth in it. And it comes with this other philosophy that we, we were thinking about, which is that we think the best people are not gonna work for us, they're gonna work with us. 
which mm. basically means that we have to facilitate their growth in the space. And if they grow, then whatever we're building will grow as well because we inform of each other's value. And this is possible when you have digital property rights, right? If you have a property right on something, then it allows a third party to compose experiences on top of it out of the ownership of others. So that means you share the value, right? Like how we do with actual physical property. The fact yeah. that you can own a house is the reason you can have a mortgage or you can have an interior decorator or you can have a service provider or a broker or an agent, right? Or a kitchen interior designer, whatever those services are. These are third party things that actually make the value of the property more valuable because they add more services to it, which you had no control over. You just benefit from that, benefit, that sort of additional service. These are things that you can do when you have property ownership with Web3, that's possible. So yeah. in that scenario, it makes sense to invest very broadly, uh, but it also makes sense to invest broadly in the infrastructure, which is why we're heavy investors in L1 and L2 protocols. You know, we're very yeah. early in like, you know, Polygon, well, Matic at the time, of course, Flow and sort of Solana and like a whole bunch of these projects as well, because we felt that they're going to build the infrastructure, right? It's kind of like nation building. If you're thinking that there's going to be a world that's going to be constructed, you can't just build a house, right? You need the roads, right? You need the streets, you need the policy systems, you maybe need legal infrastructure, you need a population, right? And, and instead of trying to build everything ourselves, which is very hard, we decided to invest. And that's basically the strategy of Animoca Brands to really build the open metaverse by partially building, but also investing. Yeah. So, so let's switch sort of the direction on the investing side. As you mentioned, you've been super active over 150 investments now. Like if I am a NFT, I, th I think GameFi developers, and I want to pitch you, what would be like the key things that you look for as an investor if I'm, I'm, if I'm pitching you? So the very first thing that we would look for, um, you know, outside of, you know, capability, which obviously is one element, is really ethos, meaning why are you building this and what's your belief structure on this? And this is quite fundamental because mm -hmm. in the traditional sort of, you know, say business model planning in the past, you know, it, it, you know, from a typical capitalist outcome, you look at maximizing profit and maximizing return, which is very normal, right? And that's the sort of, again, the traditional sort of zero sum outcome that people look for. How do I win in this space? Whereas we think that with Web3, you know, actually the, so-called winners in the space are the ones who can share the best, are the ones who think about equity the most, and are the ones who know how to construct community. Because as you well know, in blockchain, community is everything. And yeah. if you build community in a very inequitable fashion, they will leave you. But if you build community in a just and fair manner, they will stay with you and they will help you build your world. That's a thinking that is not, not everyone is ready for very clearly. Because the tendency of being both competitive, but also looking to sort of compete with others and also outperform others has mm -hmm. been a traditional mechanism of growth. Meaning I'm better than you, you're better than me, and we're gonna sort of inform of each other, right? Yeah. But you know, the, the classic idea being that you want to literally destroy the other side, right? But it's different from having a relationship that is like a rival relationship where you can have people that are doing better than you, but actually they make you better in the process. It's like a game of chess. Right? If you are the only person who knows how to play chess well, you will never get better, which is what a monopoly is. A monopoly ultimately controls the chessboard and no player can compete because they can basically control everything. And actually what happens is innovation suffers. But if you can have an open table and everyone competes at the same level, then maybe some better person will come and play chess better than you. What happens is your game gets better. You improve in the process. Everyone benefits from this. So that type of thinking basically, which is a much more sort of sharing equitable thinking and one that is basically based more around how you can compose growth together as opposed to one that is exclusive, right? So a lot of people still think about moats in exclusive manners. We yeah. think of moats really as a mechanism in which you, know, you want to include more people. So your moat is your community, which means inclusion is your strength, not exclusion. Yeah. Those are things that are, you know, I think more common today but certainly when we started investing, you know, three, four years ago, actually not that common. So they weren't that hard, uh, hard to identify from, from the philosophy that we were trying to push at the time. Yeah. And, and, and I think sort of being the community driven and sort of inclusive mindset in some senses is actually very, very different 
from doing sort of the typical mobile gaming. And in fact, I think like also like in the reverse, um, being sort of active in this space for a few years now, that this whole concept of like, just to begin with, you actually don't want like one dominant investor that own a lot. Correct, correct. Is actually you want to have as many participants to get That's involved right. early in terms of That's ownership right. token is really something I think very difficult for a lot of the traditional, I guess, Web2 investor uh, to, to grasp and understand. It's very hard for them because they're, they're used to thinking in terms of a final outcome, right? Which basically has a winner or a loser. And it's very difficult for them to think that actually in that scenario, like a rising tide, if someone else does well, then everyone else can do well in the process as well. That's something that uh, is, is, is not, not straightforward. I think the other thing also is that the bottom line in the past has been very much profit driven. And yeah. profit, you know, while people, companies should be profitable, clearly to be sustainable, you know, the, the difference is that if you're trying to extract too much value, then actually what you're doing is you're taking away from someone, right? And so yep. ultimately uh, that means long-term, your customers are not, you're not, are you really serving your customers? Is your mindset really there to, to sort of grow them? Or mm -hmm. is your mindset starting to become where you actually are just trying to take from them? And if you think about the traditional mobile gaming business, in the beginning, it was about sort of sharing fun and all that kind of stuff. But eventually, even in the traditional free-to-play mobile gaming space, the fun mm -hmm. part has become, in many companies' cases, no longer the priority. It has become, how much money can I take out of the user? How much, what, what, what mechanism can I sort of use to extract more value from the user, as much money as possible, right? And these are actually, in all cases of business, unsustainable methods. So you can make a lot of money in the short term, but it won't last in sort of in the long term. And that's one of the reasons we also believe, you know, many of the gaming companies tend to go through these cycles because they don't think in terms of long-term sustainability, but also because the traditional investors don't promote that idea because they're not thinking about a business for a hundred years. They're thinking yeah. about, well, I want to make money in the next three to five. What's the fastest way to do it? Make as much money as possible, maybe sell it for a profit, move to the next thing. So the traditional venture capital model is incompatible in the way that I think Web3 companies need to construct themselves. Yeah, and, and one, one other thing, I don't know if I ever told you that, I remember talking to was someone from is it Argentina, uh, worked on Decentraland. Yeah, so and, Decentraland, yes. And, 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 and I think either him or one of the user was telling me that, oh yeah, I'm like super excited. Um, they were actually fundraising on Decentraland and then their investor were literally people from all walks of life. I'm That's like, right. who are your investor? He's like, oh, somebody in real estate, somebody in this. And I think like the psychology of like, sort of getting that, like the community being active investor participant so early on is mm. something that is just so different. Because in the past is looking at a gaming company is all about, do you understand how to run campaign? What's your ARPU? It's yes. very, very like. It's, it's very technical. And I think, you know, it doesn't start really, if you think about it at heart, really with the human element. And one of the things that's so powerful with you know, Web3 and blockchain is that at root base, it's about ownership. Yeah. And just like how we have a relationship with ownership that is more closer to us, it's the same here. If I have a closer relationship with things that I could own, right, then I will invest more into it and I am more emotionally attached to it. But if I basically don't own it, then I'm renting, just like your own house. If you own your house, you will take good care of it. If you rent it, maybe not so much, right? It's yeah. the same idea. Yeah. So, so on that note, just back to sort of to help our audience to get a better sense in terms of stage geography, you have very, very active Web3 metaverse, uh, NFT related, but at what stage and what's your typical check size and does geography matter? Geography does not matter at all. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, I think for us, we just look for the right places that have the talent and the opportunity space that we're looking at. So for instance, we now also have three accelerators, one for Sandbox itself, one an NFT accelerator, and one for gaming guilds right now that's just started. You know, and these are, you know, we have applications from all over the world, but also mm -hmm. ourselves, if we look at the invest, you know, we love, you know, companies that are coming out of Vietnam, for instance, or Philippines or, yeah. or Africa, you know, South America, for instance, I have, of course, Hong Kong as well, but all over the world. So it's not geographically restricted. As I say again, it really comes down to, you know, what your ethos is and whether you're trying to construct and build open. So if you're not building open, 
because there's a lot of companies out there saying I'm building the next metaverse, but what they're really building is closed platforms. We're not interested. So mm. it has to be, you have to build open because that's the only way in which you can create a shared network effect. So the shared network effect is incredibly important for our overall philosophy. The other thing that we also really look for is people who are thinking, and this is sort of multifaceted, right? But are thinking deeper beyond just the product itself, right? There's a lot of people who know how to build product really well, but you know, there's a certain set of people who think in terms of product and the people that they affect, right? And these yeah. are very mission-oriented people, like, like the people you know, that you work with or you've invested in, those who care about the mission and the vision you know, basically becomes a purpose greater than their own. And that actually drives them forward and gives them the energy to do what they need to do because it's so important to them, right? And with Web3, you find a lot of people like that, actually, if you, if you start looking more so than you find in Web2. Not because I don't think people in Web2 are, don't have that capacity, but because the business model in Web2 does not promote those kind of companies, right? Mm. You, if, you, if you're a company that is trying to create a shared network effect in Web2, you might get eaten alive because there's no construct in which you can actually uh, benefit from it, really. But in Web3, because you're building on chain, the value is already inherent. So I think there's some real sort of interesting thinking around that. But you know, as you know, right, as an active investor in the space, how many people really understand blockchain? Right? The kind of person that needs to understand blockchain has to be someone who is a bit of a humanities person too. Right? He has to care about equity. Well, then if he cares about equity, he probably has to understand democratic frameworks. To understand democratic frameworks, he needs to understand a little bit of politics, social studies, and history, right? It's actually a very multifaceted person. It is not a person who is just a very good engineer. It has to be someone who is much more worldly. Yeah. And so in terms of a stage early, uh, that's what you focus on. All stages. On. Sorry, all stages. So wow. we, we have led rounds, right? You know, we have cut like, you know, hundred million dollar checks <laughs> and we've also done we've also done uh, you know two hundred fifty thousand dollar C checks so for us it is less important which stage we play because unlike other funds we are not a, a VC fund hmm. meaning that we don't have LPs so in a fund you need to extract you know in terms of the value if you have a return you sell the value and the LP gets funds returned for us everything's out of balance sheet yeah. So all the value accrues in the company, but it also means that we can invest and build in a manner that we think is long term. So, for instance, you know, we hold on to our tokens <laughs> very tightly for the most part, right? Uh, unless we think the project isn't working, that's a different story. But mm -hmm. generally speaking, we're very, very long term because we think of you know tokens as infrastructure for the metaverse, and that means it would be silly for us to basically you know liquidate very early on because we wouldn't know what to do with a lot of fiat, right? And if we had LPs we probably have an obligation to sell our position and then basically distribute. But we think the space needs people who are creating more productive capital, one that's operating. And so that's kind of the role we play. So, so I guess, you know, are we an investor? Yes, but are we a VC? Not really in the sense that we don't have LPs. Got it. Um, yeah, trust me, I completely get that. Uh, although I do think that these days investors and LPs are also getting a lot smarter about yes. uh, holding on the token. Yes. And and then also the dynamic of you know, token in terms of lockup is now getting more healthier and healthier, which means that you know being a long-term investor um, is is completely fine like, to hold for a few years. Yes. Well, I think now because of the token infrastructure, those investors who get it understand that there's actually a better benefit for holding and maintaining and supporting than for quick exit, right? I think this is you know in 2017, 2018 when the only use case was really for speculation back in the early days, then of yeah. course, you know, people would just cash out to fiat because that's all it was good for at the time. But today it's different because, you know, your virtual existence is actually valuable. Your virtual assets actually have, you know, perhaps more social standing and social purpose than your physical mm -hmm. ones. So, yeah. you know, that, in that sense, suddenly you need to start really building, you know, a profile and a bank in the metaverse, one that you hadn't had before. So you need to start investing in it long-term because you see the long-term benefits of having it, not just in terms of value, but in terms of you know, social opportunities or business opportunities as well. We talk quite a bit about like, things that you look for in the person and the team. Mm -hmm. I guess from a 
from sort of the, the space itself, like is there any sort of specific white space or things that you're like dying to see in terms of investment? So first, everything we do has to relate to digital property rights. So if it affects and benefits the space of digital property rights, come talk to us, <laughs> right? Uh, so for instance, normally speaking, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense for us, for instance, to be investing in an NFT lending platform, but we still do it because NFT lending platforms add more value or add more utility for people who have NFTs, right? So, so for us, NFTs are basically this atomic unit of the metaverse. It's the things, the objects, the assets of the metaverse. So they become a key part. In terms of what we're dying to see, well, honestly speaking, there's so many exciting things that are developing. I wouldn't say so much at what I'm dying to see. It's just the fact that everyone's building so much exciting stuff that on, you know, like, like, you know, if we, if we could, if, you know, our limitation is the ability to review deals as quickly as we can. Sometimes we announce deals, you know, three, three deals in a week, which is unusual, but it happens sometimes as they stack up because we're, we're trying to be sort of, um, uh, sort of as, as growth oriented as we can. You know, one of the things that, um, I would like to see more of, but not as a, you know, missing aspect because people are innovating in the space anyway. But what I would like to see more of is more open composability by many of the sort of new startups that are out there. Because mm -hmm. many of the Web2 developers are still going into Web3, are still thinking very much in, you know, the closed ecosystem, I control everything, because that's the Web2 thinking, right? They're yeah. not actually thinking, how do I compose on top of others? For instance, who said that you have to start a new game from scratch? Why don't you make a game with the board apes? Or why don't you make a game on Sandbox? Or why don't you make a game with, you know, CryptoPunks? Like, you know, you don't have to build your own. And in fact, if you build a game or an experience for CryptoPunks owners or board apes owners or Sandbox owners, actually you get that customer and you can sell to them right away. You know, yeah. th 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 that's the platform. But because you're coming from web two, sometimes people are like, oh, I need to create my own game. I create my own assets and everything. And that might be true for some, but you yeah. know, I don't think that has to be true for the for for the mid to long term and so these are all these new business ideas that can be constructed you know i could just give you a physical example that we often give which is you know the the fact that we can have decentralized ownership of cars is the reason a business like uber and lyft could be created is the reason we have car wash companies is the reason you have charging stations people who build car parks you know people who build roads fuel economies you know uh, engineers mechanics the industry of people around the ownership of cars is much larger than the selling of the cars itself. You know, yeah. Web 2 is, I'm just selling cars, right? You know, Web 3 is the industries around the people who are selling cars. You could try to sell cars too, but actually you might have a bigger opportunity actually constructing on top of the ownership of others, right? So that part, I would say, I would like to see more of. It's happening, but it needs you to expand the thinking of, oh, I don't need to actually make my own assets. I could just use the assets and get customers that way. Cool, I, I love it. Um, so for, for the audience, just to let you guys know, we will open up uh, for open Q&A and bring you guys, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in a Q&A and I'm going to actually invite some of you to join us at in, um, in five minutes. So uh, we have a handful of audience actually from, from Hong Kong and many of them are founders and I, I'm going to actually end this whole conversation at the end on, on ecosystem, but sure. just for our founders in terms of like pitching tips, I think Hong Kong now is still in great lockdown. I'm super sad about it. I can't wait to go back to see my parents, but we are still in a place where like, I probably need to pitch you um, or, or I'm basically doing all my pitches actually on, on Zoom. Is right. there any like tips particular for Hong Kong founders um, great. Like I land, I land uh, um, an opportunity to pitch you. And so now what do I need to do to stand out? Like other than I have great personality and I'm very community and inclusive, but, but it's initial to, so get you, you're going to write a check. Like what are the key things you feel that we need to address particular for founders in Hong Kong? Well, first of all, I would say that there's some very basic tips, right? Which I think everyone is looking at anyway, but these basic tips do talk about investing in your overall infrastructure that basically creates um, the presentation material. You know, like, you know, in the physical world, you would actually go to, you know, something like, uh, like maybe you, 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 you wear uh, good clothes or you have a nice laptop or you have, you know, like you, you bring stuff, you pr print presentation material, right? There's, these are the ways that you would normally present in the physical world that are technical 
technical presentations that make it easier. And in, in the digital world, it's the same, except if you don't bring anything physically, you would actually have a really nice camera, for instance, uh, you know, good microphone, right? Like these are very basic tips, but they are important because that's all you have. That's the voice projection you need to be able to sort of deliver. The second thing I would say is you are actually in terms of opportunity space now ex actually equal to everyone else. You oh. know, which really, if you think about it in Hong Kong, that was a disadvantage because no VC or very few VCs, you might be one of the very few VCs that would travel to Hong Kong really for family reasons that actually would look at opportunities in Hong Kong because you're also from Hong Kong, but which other investor would normally travel to Hong Kong specifically to look for Hong Kong startups? Almost nobody, yeah. right? So with Zoom, actually, you can do all of that remotely, which means you have the ability to access every investor in the world. That's actually very powerful. And today, every investor is willing to listen to you in Zoom if you have an interesting idea because yeah. some of the best investments have come through these Zoom calls. I mean, if you think about, for instance, you know, when Axie Infinity raised their capital, right? You know, a Vietnamese company, right? <laughs> Which is really sort of a small nobody company three or four years ago has recently raised at a 3 billion valuation uh, from investors that they have never met in person. I mean, yeah. this is something that you, just blows your mind today, right? But at the time would have been inconceivable. So you have that benefit. So then it comes down to obviously the pitch. And I would say this one is natural, meaning that if you really feel purposeful about and you have the energy because you believe in this vision and this is something you know, that is so important for you, it will come through. We can tell the best pitches, they may not be the best refined in terms of you know, all the eloquence, right? That's not necessary, necessary. But your sort of you know, emotions and your feelings and your energy and your passion will come through regardless of whether you're in person or whether you're in Zoom, because it's a topic you care about. So I think you need to be willing because you're, you know, I, I, this is how I think of it anyway, is that if you are willing to be more transparent and open and vulnerable in your conversations, then mm -hmm. you reveal more of your humanity, which I think you need to do today because you're not physically there. Like it's hard to yeah. read body language. It's hard to determine, you know, do you care about this or not if you're just giving a textbook read. So I never, for instance, when I give presentations, I never use, um, I, never, I never use a script. I never read um, from a script per se because mm -hmm. I find that if I do it, I lose my personality, right? And I, may, I will certainly never say the same thing to an investor twice in terms of context. The content will be similar, but my context might change based on it because I'm speaking from my heart as opposed to speaking from a text. And with Zoom, there is a temptation that you could have a teleprompter, right? Yeah. But if you do that, then I think you lose, you lose your personal essence, which is what's needed, I think. Yeah, I, I love it. I, I think for, for our founders in Hong Kong, a lot of times that like you start with showing a, the deck, I, I actually just want to see your face and, and know that you're a real person. Don't hide behind a, a deck because at the end of the day, we invest in people, um, yeah. not, not only the product or the business. It's really about you, particularly for early stage yeah. because so much- It'll so change. Yeah. change. That's um, right. Um, so with that said, we have a quite a handful of folks like wanted to ask questions. I'm going to actually promote first person, uh, Lee Christopher. Um, so I don't know if you're Lee or you're Christopher, uh, but he's, he has a very specific question about Sandbox Metaverse. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, hello, uh, I see you. It's, it's really an honor to be here. And uh, what should I say? I have been actually like, even I, like you're my idol. Like there are so many things I want to say, but just my. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Okay. I'm actually um I'm actually an HKU undergraduate student that came from South Korea. Um, I'm an international student, and I'm an been exploring and investing in different Animoca brands, portfolio companies, and then recently I even established a startup called the Meta Olympics. It's a startup in the sandbox that awesome. I actually even talked to the um. Uh, Sebastian Borje to mm. uh, talk about the prize sponsorship for the events happening right now in the speedrun competition on the sandbox. But then I found out that it's still the early stage that I didn't have um, sufficient contacts to other sandbox partners and then mm. other landowners that eventually we want to solve a problem that the minor landowners in the sandbox doesn't have a sufficient opportunities to promote their game experiences against the big brands like some exciting names that join like the metaverse like, yeah. like yeah, like Snoop Dogs, Adidas, and Gucci. Then right. I, I was wondering, 
that if the sandbox is actually trying to promote some community for the landowners so that they can promote each other, they can support each other, so that we, which I believe will permanently increase the value of the metaverse. What do yeah. you think about that? I, first of all, um, thank you. It's wonderful that you're, you're making this highlight. I think, as I said, building out for something that is more equitable and more fair is very important to us. And I think you just illustrated right now the meaning of the metaverse, which is that whether we do it or you do it, it's an opportunity. You know, at the end of the day, you have a handful of large landowners, just because like Adrian Chang or Sung Wong Kai or SEMP as well, right? They have large pieces of land and they have promotion budget. But most of the landowners own one piece of land, right? Most of them don't own 24 by 24s, which actually means that as a community, you actually have more power vested in the ones who own one or two pieces of land, not the ones who own lots of land. So then the opportunity could be well, how do I bring the power of that community together? Well, that actually, if you think about it, is kind of like democratic frameworks and opportunities that come around when you think in terms of, you know, how do you build equitable structures? So I would say that while Sandbox will be very happy to support you, I'm pretty sure they want to grow this. I don't think that it's Sandbox's role to do it. I think it's your role right. to do it or someone else's role because Perfect. this is your business opportunity. You know, in the early days in the App Store, before it became just two, as in Apple and Google Play, there were hundreds of small app stores out there. And some of them were indie developers. And for those of you who might remember, actually the iPhone actually had multiple app stores and Apple shut it down. Apple said that the software that is, the app, the, that is using iOS is our proprietary IP. Nobody can build on top of it. And therefore you're not allowed to build another discovery channel. And they killed it. And they called it piracy. And that's why you only have one app store on, on Apple. And we know what happened. They tax it, they control it. And now we are frankly all slaves to Apple if we use an iPhone. So with decentralized structures, as in the sandbox, for instance, you don't have that. Meaning that you can be able to create your own community. You can create your own game experience. You could create your own store that says, you know, sandbox experiences from like indie developers, right? And whether you do it free, charge a fee, have advertising promotion, that's entirely up to you. The important thing is you don't need our permission. And that's what's beautiful about it. You can build it any which way you like. So you do have to work it, right? But one thing you know for sure is that whatever you do from a work standpoint, we cannot take it away from you. That certainty gives you the ability to invest in it in the long run. And that certainty also allows the community to flourish. You might have competitors, you might have someone else saying, I like that idea. So let me basically do it. And just like the example I gave with you know, rivals playing chess, all those guys are going to do is make your game better because you now have competition. But who wins? The entire community. So that's why we think open structures are always ultimately going to be superior to closed structures. And you know, we welcome you to keep innovating and building on top of you know, Sandbox and also any other metaverse that you see fit. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, Lee Christopher, thank you for your questions. We have quite a few. He has a lot of fans, so thank you for attending. I'm going to bring up Ashok. A, a um, but thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the answer. Thank you. Cool. All right. Next, we're going to have Ashok. Hi. 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 Is it tilted? Hi, it's a. My oh, name yeah. is Ashok. <laughs> now, now we can see you. Very inspiring story. So I was having goosebumps when I was listening to you, how you grew up and your philosophy behind the product. I grew up in India in a, in a I would say, poor family uh, and uh, grew up in education. Been in Hong Kong for 12 years. And uh, I started, a, I left Goldman uh, to start a company. It was an open multimedia uh, device, a stackable thing, open, completely open source based on uh, Cody, back then it was called XPMC, sold that company, started an open uh, architecture, uh, invented a machine to make yogurt, and uh, that got sacrificed to COVID because the factory closed. And two years ago, I started learning to code in Unity, and uh, because looking at how kids, my kid was spending so much time at home, uh, 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 she was spending so much time at home and not getting enough exercise, so I built a game which is an immersive augmented reality game. And uh, uh, this is uh, uses body tracking mechanism built into Apple. 
and now uh, luckily to, this morning our uh, app is live in the app store now apple app store so my question is uh, uh, which uh, 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 are you, uh, metaverse would you recommend us to leverage for this app and uh, could you make a reference for us please so just to give you a little bit context the app uh, is combines uh, uh, the the education the physical activity and mindfulness i'm a, i'm a regular uh, uh, meditator and so i want to bring this to kids so that uh, they grow up as, as a complete human being and not just uh, one right uh, 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 yeah you got the point right no i appreciate that yeah yeah totally yeah. so first of all um, i would say the first way i would look at this is that don't think of building in only one metaverse um, you can build you should build in many metaverses in the long run you will build a first one you know in the beginning but generally speaking think about how it can be interoperable with as many metaverses as you can because mm -hmm. you are building a product in which you want to reach as many customers as possible right and so in the same way that you don't want to build a product that it is only for one market you want to build a product that's open for many markets obviously we would say you know maybe you should build on sandbox but but i would say the reason you build on sandbox is not only because we happen to own it but also because Sandbox has maybe the users you want. And this is a customer target audience as well. Like for instance, you could have, you know, you know, you could you could have your product in the middle of Africa and nobody cares because maybe they don't need the service, right? And so it doesn't matter whether your product is excellent. If the customers in the sandbox don't need this product or don't are not your customer segment, then it doesn't make sense for you to open in that metaverse. So if you're looking, for instance, in a fitness type metaverse, right, then maybe you want to take a look at, you know, what, for instance, you know, a company like Olivex is doing, you know, with, with, with Dose, for instance, or maybe another kind of, you know, or what Genopets is doing, for instance, with Move to Earn. Maybe as an example, those might be the kind of metaverses you want to start building out because the customer segments are maybe closer to where you are. One of the amazing things about Web3 is that the database structures of all the users are open, right? Meaning that you can, you can actually access every customer with a value added directly. You no longer have to seek permission from a platform. You can go there directly. So, you know, I think start with understanding the metaverse, which one is where your customers are most likely to be and enter that one. Cool. Great. Can you, can you introduce this to Sandbox, please? I, well, there's a there's a link, um, and I I, I I will share it. And if anyone wants to connect with me, I'm happy to make connections afterwards. Cool. Thank you very much. So, thank you for your question. I'm going to have the next question up. Bye. Bye. The next we have Albert, also from Hong Kong. Hi. I have two questions which are not related. Can you hear me? I can yeah. hear you. Uh, one is really uh, my uh, my career uh, in banking, which now I get into universities. I chair the USD and CDU Career Development Committee. And I would like to ask, what would be the best way to expose them to available opportunities, uh, Hong Kong and China, maybe even global? My first question. Second question is, uh, it's very exciting that I, I, I learned so much, uh, but in banking, I learned that, uh, yes, it is community driven, uh, but people focus on market share. If you are not the top five uh, 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 builders in the market, your cost consideration, you will be squeezed out. How would market share and cost considerations play out in your uh, type of business? Thank you. So let me start with the last question first, because I think that's at the crux of many of the things we're trying to deal with. And then we can talk about the opportunity because I think opportunities are everywhere as long as you're willing to look for it. Um, so the biggest issue that we see with banking as an industry, not banking itself, it's valuable, of course, and it's absolutely necessary in terms of creating liquidity and markets and, and, and the economies that are out there, is that it is an exclusionary process today, meaning that even though we have a bank account, we are actually financially excluded. We open a bank account, but we don't teach people about investing. They don't know about interest rates. The first experience is debt for most people in the world. So really what we're doing to our children is we're teaching them about indentured servitude by paying back loans as their first financial experience. We don't teach about financial values and economic values when they are children, even though they have the capacity to do so when they are frankly in grade school. 
So the reason why banking has become a little bit, I would say, almost a monster, not intentionally so, is because of the fact that the knowledge retained within the finance industry has become essentially the weapon that finance industry experts utilize to their own advantage. Information arbitrage is one of those things that bankers and financial industry magnets know how to do that the rest of the industry doesn't, and they are taken advantage of. Like when you look at things what happening with Robin Hood and, and, and sort of reverse order flow, or when you take a look at, for instance, financial knowledge broadly, or when you even look at credit card debt, or you know, basically interest rates, right? These are circumstances that happen because you don't understand it, right? And so really, you know, the problem is that the financial constructs benefit those who are in the system, but they don't benefit anyone who's not in the system. And while there was a time where there was an opportunity, say, maybe my parents' generation, for instance, who could advance into that space today for the younger generation to get into that space is almost impossible. It's one of the reasons why, for instance, in Hong Kong, you know, you know, I would argue that, you know, if you look at the traditional sort of opportunity, you ask yourself, can you actually really own your house, build a family, and live your sort of the, the dream that you're supposed to live with the pathway that you have with the current financial construct? It doesn't. And by the way, that's the reason, this is not just Hong Kong, it's the US, it's Europe, it's everywhere in the world. And that is yeah. the reason why you have things like, you know, Wall Street bets, it's why you have Tesla, you know, and it's frankly, it's why you have the whole crypto movement going on. So that's basically a revolt towards the fact that this system does not work for me. You know, our parents could enjoy 10 or 15% interest rates, right? <laughs> that was that generation, right? We don't even get like, 0.1%, and then we're supposed to be okay with it because it works for the people who benefited from it, not from the ones. So that's the paradigm shift. Now, in terms of the opportunity space, I would argue that every young graduate, if they're thinking about this, unless they already have, you know, let's say inherited wealth, which is a different story, right? You know, if they want to go and build out and carve out a sort of a future for themselves, it has to be in a paradigm that they can shape. And the metaverse is one that they understand intrinsically better than you know, the older generation because they're digitally natives, they get that space. And as we should, we should make room for that opportunity space to develop. How does it happen? Well, this is the part where you know, we have to move away from the classic, in my view, instructive sort of uh, system, which is to say, look at this place, look at that place. <laughs> Actually, that, that's the problem, right? We're still trying to direct you know, our university graduates about the solutions they should try to find. Ideally, you know, during college or even before, they should already be able to navigate the space and say, what do I want to do per se, right? How do I understand yeah. it? And that comes from, you know, having awareness of, you know, I think in large part, financial knowledge starting in my mind in kindergarten, right? You know, mm -hmm. we, teach our, we teach our children math. So why can't we teach them economics on day one, right? It doesn't make sense, right? And and so I think this is kind of where I feel like, you know, the future, which, which I'm excited about is that, Imagine what happens if, you know, 90% of the world is now truly financially literate. It will add liquidity to the market in an incredible way. It will also make the banking system, what was previously considered exclusionary, very inclusionary because we all have base knowledge that is roughly the same, which is why DeFi is so exciting. For those people who are in the space, they go, oh my goodness, I can do this. I have something that, you know, I have full awareness as to the space. Now, for the students currently, you know, at, at university, you know, I would say just get started and in, in open up a, you know, DeFi wallet, be it MetaMask or something, you know, take a small amount, put it into a liquidity pool. It's small money. But, you know, if the school won't teach you how to do it, you, are, you owe it to yourself to do it yourself. And the resources out there are a lot. You don't need, you don't need to have a lot of money uh, to do it. You can start small. Yeah. Um, Albert, thank you for your questions. We have a few more for uh, for for Yat. And good to see you and hope to see you in Hong Kong soon. Thank you. Um, and yet I want to bring up one thing uh, before Salchik asked this question is that um, recently average age of our founders that raise capital invested in is 20. And many, many of them started coding when they were 13. And the co-founders actually was hanging out, never even have a bank account and just hacking things out and build things online. So, uh, Sochek, think this happened to be one of my portfolio founders, calling from New York. Good to see you. Haven't seen you for two years. 
uh, <laughs> your, your turn for asking the question. Cool. Hi there, nice to meet you. I'm Salchuk, uh, CEO of Punch. We're building an interoperable metaverse that lets people jump into their favorite games, kind of like Discord meets Roblox on the blockchain. And one of the things, obviously we share your vision of interoperability on true ownership because when you buy something on a game like Fortnite, you're just renting it. And interoperability on true ownership is obviously good for the players and the ecosystem, but we also work very close with a lot of AAA studios and game developers as there are investors like Supercell and Electronic Arts and like other folks. And one of the things that we hear when we talk about NFTs and Web3 is that, well, we have an economy that is centralized and it's making money. Why is it good for us, right? Because we spend all this money in building these digital assets. Why would we want people to kind of sell it to other people? And I think it's kind of an innovator's dilemma, right? Um, how do you see major game studios and companies whose games are played by millions of players move into Web3? What are some of the things over the next two, three years that's going to kind of enable that transition from like a major game studio perspective? So we spend quite a bit of time thinking about this. And mm -hmm. I actually think that the big game studios are going to struggle entering into this field because it's not just trying to change the games that you have today. It's also trying to change the mindset of entire organizations that have that made money in an extractive manner. And so this is the thing, right? Just because, and you hear this a lot, right? Just because you make it, made a successful game doesn't necessarily mean that you understand anything about economics per se, right? Because yeah. traditional games, you know, as I describe it often, are kind of economies that run very similar to, say, Venezuela, right? <laughs> because it's totally inflationary and it's arbitrary and it's simply controlled by whoever has a decision. Oh, we need to control yeah. inflation. Let's just cut this, right? I mean, you can't yeah. do this in a real economy, right? Because, you know, you're not, you're not actually a user. You're actually citizens, right? In a sense. So, so mm -hmm. that's the foundation of this. And so the kind of people who need to be successful in this are the ones that have a strong sense of equity and are actually yeah. share similar traits to true nation builders, right? Who think about the, the balance of things. Like if I do this, what is the consequence? You know, and also really are usually very careful about not wanting to hurt people. So this is something that in very traditional game developers is hard to do. But the yeah. added issue for mostly Western game companies is that right now, because they've abused their gamers for such a long period of time with free to play and extractive uh, sort of things, the idea that an NFT would be shown, which could potentially make my game assets even more expensive, is essentially something that they're revolting today. And you can see yeah. with many of the bigger Western game companies, Eastern game companies in Asia, they don't care. They're like property rights come give it to me, right? But for the ones in the West, they're struggling. And so many of them have retreated from the position. Business-wise, they're like, this is the right thing to do. But actually, from a consumer standpoint, people don't like it because they're afraid that the one thing that they enjoy that doesn't cost an arm and a leg might possibly be taken away and become another Ferrari, LVMH, Gucci, yeah. you know, Prada type experience to the exclusion of others, right? And I think to me, this is more a reflection of the state of the world that we're in right now, that we feel this way, because we have a situation where, you know, because especially exacerbated with COVID, we've been extracted out, you know, the middle class is being squeezed away, you know, the wealthier mm -hmm. are wealthier, the poor are getting poorer, and people are just like, this is my, my best entertainment, why are you taking it away from me, right? And you also identify this. So I actually think traditional game companies are going to really struggle. Instead, I think the companies like yourself and, and ourselves or other ones who are paving this path are the ones who are really going to uh, sort of pave that way. And eventually the big game companies are going to have no choice but to enter yeah. because they're going to be closed metaverses that actually don't share the network effect. And there is no way in my mind that they can possibly compete because they are working on rental economics. It's yeah. the reason why the ARPU is small. They need... 10 million users to be successful. But in a Web3 paradigm, you need 10,000 people to be successful, maybe even just 2,000 people because there's ownership economics. And therefore, you know, how can you possibly compete in those paradigms? It's an unfair advantage that basically any company that's doing something in Web3 and blockchain has. So they have to go there for survival or die, but I think they can't do it quickly because of the innovator's dilemma as you described. Oh. Um, such a good to see you. I will catch see up you with you at GDC. <laughs> All right. Very nice uh, meeting you. Nice meeting you. All right. Um, I always sort of famous for keeping everything on time. And it is 7 o'clock p.m. on our side. Um, Incredible. But I, 
And thank you so much, Yad, for, for taking the time. I love our conversation. And seriously, we have one of the audience uh, literally we're saying like we just listened to the pop of, uh, of, of gaming I'm like wow this is the first um, but for those of you apologize not able to answer all your questions I know that you guys have tons of questions for Yat. Um, he shared on our on our chat um, his LinkedIn on Twitter please ping him follow him um, I'm definitely very very inspired by this conversation I think there's definitely a hope for decentralized game fi DeFi I really think that there is a lot more very, very exciting opportunities, especially for young entrepreneurs. And put, to wrap this up, this is for Hong Kong founders. Um, the world is flat. And please ping us, let us how we can be helpful. And we want to see you on Zoom. We wanted to support you. And um, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. And I will see everybody around. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah, same. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Stay safe and healthy. Bye, guys. You too. Bye.